So I will try and uh, give you a little bit of insight as to what the integration of health service is looking like in England at the moment. I think it will have a lot of similarities to what uh, I'm hearing is, is, the, is the project and the mission that many of you are embarking upon. Um, I'm going to get this sooner or later, but it may be later. It doesn't like me. Space bar. Space bar. Space bar. Yes. Yay. Okay, so um, I thought I should say a little bit. I'm a bit, you know, I thought I'd be quite a bit of explanation to explain what I'm doing here and where I'm coming from into this issue because uh, my day job uh, is actually running uh, a local authority, which in England is uh, called a county council. Um, it's some, it's a, it has many of the functions of a province, uh, social services, education, transport, infrastructure, public health, culture, you know, the whole lot. Um, it, we, we have an average uh, annual budget of about 1.6 billion pounds a year, so it's a big operation complex with many different functions. We spend a million pounds a day on social services for adults. So some days we sit in meetings, you know, and we hear the clock ticking. <laughs> so it's a lot, uh, and it's not getting smaller, uh, but just managing it within that scale. And this is adults, probably two-thirds of that million would be older people, uh, mainly people over 80, and uh, the balance would be people um, 18 to 65 with uh, disabilities, different kinds. So it's, it's a big operation. And our priority definitely is to enable people to live at home live longer and healthier. I mean, that, that is what we are trying to do. Um, the context in Britain as well is not uh, easy financially. I mean, my organization has taken 350 million pounds out of it in the last three years, taking another 125 million out of it in the next three. So, so we're, you know, our whole strategy is not just it would be nice to keep people at home, it would be essential to empower people, to keep the community uh, resources in enabling people to do what they tell us they'd like, which is to not be uh, processed through an acute uh, medical system, but to be supported to stay at home. And we call this in the jargon of England at the moment, demand management. This is our big deal. I don't know if this language is common here, but this is what we're, what we're calling it. So that, that's my, my real job, is I'm chief executive of this operation. And it's a very pretty place, just so I'm not going to dwell on the pictures, but it's a very diverse place. We have a national park, we have lots of stately homes, we have a North Norfolk coast where David Attenborough comes all the time and buys stuff and helps us out. Uh, we've got a wind farm off Great Yarmouth, which is providing about 20% of the um, not a renewable energy in the country. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a big place and it's got lots going on. And that's really my main job, actually, is to do this. <laughs> but because uh, I am so interested in healthcare, um, when this new innovation of uh, the NHS, uh, the National Health Service, was introduced, um, the Sustainable Transformation Plans, so I, I had the opportunity, I was invited to, uh, to lead this, this uh, network of services. Um, and I'll, I'll say a little bit about uh, that here. We, in about five, you know, we have something, a national policy initiative uh, that's called this five-year forward view. If you Google it, you will find a, a, just a rash of policy initiatives. It was launched by uh, the National Health Service England, which is NHE, um, and it really tried to give some vision for what the next five years needed to look like, uh, and it launched some new models of sustainable care. Uh, it was really in a context where um, what we call the Lansley reforms, which were introduced in 2012, had left a very fragmented health and uh, social service system. You'll probably have already noticed that the, the social services are on the local authority side, and the health services are under the NHS. So that <coughs> itself creates a different kind of challenge than what you here, have here. But I probably also should say that I have 84 elected councillors who are my bosses very local elected councillors, you know, with more like a municipal councillor, I guess, but at scale. Uh, they're governing the health, uh, the social service side, and the health side is run through a, a much more vertical hierarchy from, uh, from the government. So, so that was, uh, the, the health system had become very fragmented. Local government had remained, you know, pretty, pretty stable in, in this time, apart from the money. Uh, so when Simon Stevens came into, who was the chief executive of the NHS, you know, he was faced with this dilemma. Uh, I don't think anyone thought 
I'm, a, I'm away from the country, right, so I can say this with uh, impunity. Uh, I don't think anybody thought the Lansing reforms were a good idea, <laughs> except him. And he didn't last very long in the cabinet even. So, you know, it, he was the minister for a fairly short time. But he did create a huge amount of structure change. There may have resonance here as well, I'm not sure. But anyway, <laughs> the, uh, the, um, so, so, the, so the challenge for Stevens was to create a, a, a system that could be more uh, adapted to the modern environment and introduce 44 what are called place-based STPs. And again, at some level, this may sound <laughs> obvious that you should have services around a place, but that hadn't been the main model up until now. They were being run through more fragmented systems of commissioning, providing, foundation trusts, all very independent. Um, I put the little video on earlier about how the NHS works because I didn't want to spend a an hour explaining <laughs> the, the institutional framework. It's complex. Uh, and that's why if you want to hear after the little video that was on over lunch, in six minutes it kind of explains the whole thing, which is better than I could do. But mainly the, the, the move to a place was integrating uh, the commissioning sides, which they call CCGs, the hospital trusts, which were pretty independent companies almost, uh, meant to be running as independent, you know, borrowing from banks, being much more commercial. Uh, community services also moving into trusts bringing that together and then having it work with, with the local authority. So this is the concept of a place-based SDP. If you're running something like I am, you know, a, a local authority that has the social services side of the business, it's very dangerous to have the NHS running in an overheated position towards acute activity. <laughs> you know, I need it to come, in so come alongside with us and move the whole system uh, towards the community, what we call in our jargon at the moment, left shift. Why? Anyway, you make these things up. Uh, this has become the shorthand for moving services into the community. So this was the big idea, and, and uh, I think you know it had broad support in the country. It, it set out three objectives, this five-year forward view. The first one, foremost, was to improve the health of the population, uh, and that was very clear uh, as the focus. The second objective was to improve the quality of care. And the third element was the efficiency and productivity of the NHS. I mean, the NHS is one of the most productive and efficient systems in the country, but the money is limited. So uh, like Quebec, like many places with a tax-funded uh, health system, you need to uh, control and contain the cost. So those are the three main objectives. Everyone has a map. This is my map. Um, this is, <laughs> this is the, the bulge into the North Sea. That's uh, the part of England that I'm responsible for. It has a population of, uh, of over a million. It's Norfolk and Waveney, they call it. Um, these, it has five CCGs, which, if, again, if you're running the whole county, that's way too many, because I'm commissioning services for the whole county, and it was commissioning them in small sections. So, you know, quite complex, a lot of transactional cost. Um, we have a mental health trust, ambulance trust, three acute hospitals. Uh, I was just trying to think of it if we're overbedded compared to you, but we have about uh, 1,700 uh, general and uh, uh, specialist beds. We have a big um, teaching hospital as well that's funded by PFI, so another commonality we have um, at the Norfolk and Norwich Hospital, but 119 GP, GP practices. And again, I don't know how this comparison scale to here, but we have 11,000 beds, residential care beds, people older beds for older people. So, so there's a lot of activity and very fragmented. Each one of these elements was being run pretty much independently. Too much, we think. No. We don't have enough. You don't have long. enough? All right. <laughs> we, uh, we could share. <laughs> send them all away. We'll send you the boat. Well, it's, you know, this is my responsibility, so I have to pay for that part. So, um, you know, we're trying to, we have a relative, we, we benchmark everything like you do, so we, we have too many people, we think, relative to the national average on our family benchmark group, more people, particularly under 65s, in residential care than we think is a good idea. You know, young mentally ill people, it's not good. So, so we have some shifting to do. So and we also had to prepare the population for change. The, the, uh, the British population is as attached to, the, its, to its NHS as, the, as Quebec and Canada is to its health service. So any time you do anything, it's never good <laughs> from the population point of view. So, so there was a whole, for, I will think about this as a big change management project. And this is one of the kinds of 
snapshots of fact that we would try and get people to understand. You know, the world is not the same. You know, uh, when it was founded in '48, we had 450,000 beds across the UK. People mainly were going into hospital for polio and tuberculosis. You know, nobody does anymore. Um, we now have 135,000 beds, and mostly it's day surgery. So, you know, it's just trying to get people ready for this. Is not a new thing. Change. It's an ongoing process, uh, and we've done a lot of it already. Uh, I won't take too long on this. I mean, our population, like yours, is growing. If you have a place as pretty as Norfolk, everybody comes to live there when they retire. So we have a particular issue around older people around the North Norfolk coast and the National Park area. So we have a, we'll have about a 38% increase of people over 75 uh, in the next 10 years, well, less than that by 2025. We have a big problem with obesity and diabetes and heart disease. Um, people really w would prefer to be treated in a home rather than in hospital and we need to change about 45 percent. We did a lot of work at actually looking at the work coming into the hospital and seeing how much of it could be shifted out uh, and that's where the 45 percent comes from. And I guess there's an overriding imperative. We, there, we quite like to do forecast and modeling. There's a lot of economic modeling that gets done and if we continued not we do nothing, that's not fair, but if we continue doing what we do now, into the future we reckoned we would be about 415 million pounds short of what we need on a system of about 2.6 billion. So, you know, not possible just to go on as we are. I won't go through these, we, but we get very good uh, epidemiological data um, and, you know, we're beginning to use it more and more, which is, I think, why this overriding imperative in, of improving the health of the population was quite, was quite good to have. And you know we can model it up to show the number of uh, uh, presented service users that would represent in each of uh, uh, our services and how much that would cost. So this is just an example of obesity, um, the, the diseases that would translate into and the cost it would represent. And I won't go through these, but these are this is the kind of planning that we've done and tried to explain to the population. This is the. Uh, you know, the population on the, with the purple is the uh, growth in older people. Uh, particularly, I mean, for us, I think like here, over 65 is young, you know. <laughs> so we only really start worrying about people presenting for services at 80, 85. We start anticipating them at 75. So you can see the increase there and what it would mean in terms of that or hospital pressures. All this to, you know, really just give you an idea of, of the of the case for change which we were making as part of the STP. Um, this translates over into acute pressures and you know a, a recognition that we would never be able to meet this level of demand in our current system with any likely uh, future funding available. So we so this group of, of organizations have come together and I'll show you how we do that in a moment. Uh, and agreed these priorities, that we would increase access to primary care and general practice. And in this five-year forward view, there's a whole new care model for, for general practice. Um, you know, that we would attempt to c integrate ever more uh, strongly health and social care in neighborhood teams. We have some now, but we, we have plans to make them more integrated. Uh, strengthen out-of-hospital community services, particularly for the frail elderly. Um, and very big commitment to reducing hospital demand for urgent and emergency admissions. Um, on, and on the opposite of that, you know, I guess it's the same here. If the hospital is, is, is got an unmanaged front door, its elective surgery becomes problematic. You know, the delay is happening. So, so we were trying to stop, you know, manage the front door, reduce demand there to allow the elective uh, surgery. I won't go through our waiting times, but they are still something you can't imagine. <laughs> I mean, we have four. If, if you get, if you miss your four-hour wait at the univer, at the emergency, I mean, you're you're on the minister's carpet. You know, I don't think we. I mean, when I was in Montreal, we were not achieving anything like four-hour waits at emergency. And this isn't average. It's like no one waits more than four hours. So, so so we have similar targets for elective surgery. Months have to be hit. So if you if you're not on time, for you're in trouble. So getting elective procedures up and getting the uh, acute system working across the three hospitals me and mental health. These, these are our main priorities for the uh, SGP plan. Again, I won't go through these charts, but they, they are really just trying to illustrate that we have committed ourselves to reducing 20% of A&E attendances over the next four years, and uh, that represents about 55,000 attendances, and then we're going to reduce um, emergency admissions by 25,000 another 20%. And these are the ways that we're doing it here. 
ways in which you know I heard from all of you today, very similar to the kinds of things. It's not magic. I think what's magical for me in the in the time where I f th these organizations were competing because you know we're on a tariff, we're, we're activity based, right? So. Uh, to get people together and start cooperating and seeing, you know, how this could be uh, made to work, why it had to work. I think the biggest thing is getting people to believe that you can do it. And we have, I'll show you a bit of numbers where we have already begun to do it. And I think it's that belief, you know, from a managing of change point of view, which has been to me the most important. Also, length of stays, we've got to reduce those too, and we have plans for doing that. So a year on, I mean, that's it. that was the first year was really, you know, what, do, what kind of trouble are we in? Big trouble, <laughs> you know, we can count it, we can see it coming, how, we can begin to see the interventions that we need to do to fix it. Uh, we have to bring the population uh, uh, along a bit, and we have not achieved that by any means well, but it's still, uh, we're trying to, to persuade people that change can, is necessary, and some of the change will be good. So we're a year on, and uh, as we moved to the next phase of it, you know, we've moved from plans, as I say, which were mainly about forecasting a future which could be sustainable, to partnerships where we've organizing ourselves now to deliver these plans. And the next stage of the campaign is these ca accountable care systems. So that's the phase that we've been in in, in the last 18 months. Um, I, I didn't want you to feel you're the only ones who had really complicated organization charts, so this is ours. Um, I, I have to say that we got to make this one ourselves. Uh, we didn't have it made in the ministry and sent to us. Uh, so that at least gives us some understanding. We think it's what we need, although it is still more complex. Uh, I won't go through each element of it, but basically what it means is that the, in, the existing institutional structures that we have are not the way we're going to make this change happen. So we've created a sort of a parallel universe voluntarily, which is called the SDP. This middle green part that says SDP Executive Board, that's the thing that I've been uh, leading. We have a set of um, non-execs, which would be like your board directors, who are coming together across these, these 14 institutions who are the oversight group. And we have organized across our institutions the things we need to do into these work streams on a very kind of pretty classical program management basis. And it's all voluntary. I mean, we didn't have to do it, um, and we could organize it as we wanted. Uh, more or less similar activity across uh, the country, to be honest, though. Prevention, demand management, which as I say is getting work out of acuity and into, and into the community. Uh, acute care reform is getting more of the clinical pathways and uh, chains across the three hospitals working. Mental health, we have a huge amount to do to get our mental health services in the state. We need to, the, the slogan there is uh, parity of esteem between physical and mental health, and that's very much what we're, we're working on, but much to do. And then there's a series of system enablers, uh, are, which are around uh, the buildings we own, you know, the IT, IT that we have, how we keep the sustainable uh, workforce. So, so it's a huge endeavor, and it's all brought together to deliver the plan, um, and it's... Uh, you know, a lot of work. <laughs> and the thing that mainly is, I guess, is the relationships, is it? Because this only works if you have relationships. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I think that's where we have made great progress. So this is just an, a, a small s snip of, of, of demonstrating that in the year that we've been in existence, you know, we have actually shifted our A&E uh, attendances. This is a piece of uh, analysis done by our public health team. Okay, public health works for me in the local authority, which is also maybe a bit different. So it's split uh, from, from the health service. Um, you know, and it shows that on utilization rates, you know, if, if you take the standard admission rate being the hundred, the black dotted line in the middle, you know, we are, we are shifting uh, against the norm on attendances quite significantly by 254,000. We've shifted our admissions a bit. Electives have gone up and that's what we needed to do because we have these RTT deadlines. I don't even know what RTT, but it means your deadlines for how long you have to wait for elective surgery. And if you don't get those down, you don't get money. <laughs> so it's a pretty big motivator. Um, and we've managed to increase those significantly. And our follow-up uh, has improved in the way we want it. It's, you know, it's just one example, but it, I think it's really important that if you set out to do something, and this is a really strong culture, I think, now in the UK, you put numbers on it. <laughs> targets, and they may be, you know, a bit hopeful, 
<laughs> or they're, they're, you don't really know for sure what you can achieve, but you, you do analysis and you project the best you think you can do, and then you, tra uh, you monitor the trajectory of it. And I think the, the value of that, as opposed to writing about it, it, you know, is that there is a sense of achievement that people have when they see the, move, the, the numbers beginning to move. Because everyone is a patient, uh, as, as someone said earlier today. Um, my piece of the action, importantly, is, is these 11,000 care beds. And one of the big issues, I don't know if it's an issue here or not, but is that uh, a, a lot of the ad unplanned emergency admissions into hospitals come from the care homes. You know, it's, in a way, it's kind of silly. Somebody's already in a total institution. Why are we taking them to another place uh, for sometimes fairly routine uh, um, uh, medical emergency. So, so there's been a, a care model to um, to show how you could reduce through introducing enhanced health care <coughs> services in the residential care homes. How you could reduce uh, reduce emergency admissions. The King's Fund model suggested you could reduce it by 40 percent. That's what we're working for. Um, we had about 5,500 emergency admissions from our care homes. Uh, uh, in 2016, that's a you know average cost of about three thousand each, um, and more than one in four were seen as things that were what we call ambulatory care sensitive conditions, which meant they could have gone somewhere else. So, so if we, if we just crack this by ten percent, you know we would make a, a very significant reduction um, in in the cost of it and and also the quality of life. The last thing you want if you're in a home is you know to be moved uh, again. So these are just two examples of the kind of very focused work. There's more going on than I can even keep track of most days. Um, but I guess what I'll just focus on as I'm kind of running towards the end of my time is, you know, okay, what's a local authority doing in this business? <laughs> I've learned a bit more about healthcare than I used to know. I know what an ambulatory care sensitive condition is and those kind of things. Uh, but it's not really my main expertise. Mine is to run a local authority. So, so what's our contribution to this? Um, I think what, we're, what really motivates me to be, remain involved in this activity is to make, make sure that there's some balance to the medical system so that, the, so that health has a, a social contribution being made by the rest of the public service. Um, you know, the, uh, the social services, public health, and right the way through to housing, environmental services, you know, these are the things we are responsible for. And, if, and, and I think also we probably have a better relationship to the population because I've got 84 councillors who have to get elected every few years. So, you know, this, this has an engagement that's a little different than my health colleagues who, who don't need to, to worry about the electoral cycle, at least locally. They do nationally, but not locally. So, so some of the things we've done here is, you know, is put this huge effort into reducing residential placements so that people can live at home. And we have uh, um, made some success at that, particularly for the under 65s. We've made a big push on what I've called reprofessionalizing social work, and uh, this is my professional origin, I guess, so I'm particularly proud of this. You know, we were into a process, we were measuring people, <laughs> you know, assessment, everything, uh, and then, you know, figuring out how many points got what kind of thing, and then commissioning that, uh, and we even have people doing, you know, assessment, somebody else doing care um, a package organizing, somebody else doing commissioning, somebody else then uh, invoicing the patients for it. You know, this is all. This was what social work has has become here in Britain, and I guess maybe to some extent here as well. What we're doing is just we're dropping the whole case management system. We're trying to get the social workers to be engaged with clients, and it's my director of adult services, says, and then stick to them like glue. You know, <laughs> so not hand them off to lots of different processes, but meet them early, get to know them soon, get to know their family, and then. Uh, you know, not hand them off and just try and assume that they're coming through a door like an assembly line to be measured for a service. They're coming through the door for us to get to know them so that they do not need a service <laughs> because, you know, they don't, service is not life, you know, uh, service is only what you need for a small proportion of the population. So the, the changing definitely to a more help and less uh, assessing deficit, more working with strengths. Mm -hmm. We've had a couple of really successful campaigns to make the county less lonely. We've run this big campaign here in the picture you see in good company. You know, uh, our public health people tell us nationally, you know, that the huge proportion of uh, morbidity is, is actually related to, if not caused by, uh, loneliness. And so, we're, you know, we're a big county, a lot of rural people. We have 
we've got a hashtag, no lonely day, you know, and we, 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 we've got a, a special quality badge you can get if you're a company and other people who do do this. So thousands of volunteers are being mobilized to, uh, to keep people in touch. Dementia friendly, you know, we've designed a, there is a national program of dementia friendly villages and we are, um, we have more of these villages that have embarked on this campaign. These are low level social things, but we believe that they will, you know, not just in the long run, but actually in the short run, begin to make quite a big difference. So these are the campaigns. Social prescribing, we're very big on this, uh, and it's one of the main things that my uh, public health people are leading on. I mean, in the olden days, this would be called community work. You know, as an old community worker, <laughs> it looks a lot like community work, but now it's going to be called social prescribing. It gets way more traction in the health system, if you call it that. So I'm, I'm flexible, we'll call it that. But basically, it's these people being working in the GP surgeries, uh, working in the communities, linking people with other services, you know, organizing health walks, doing the kind of uh, some of the more structured, the dementia, uh, the obesity, d um, uh, diabetes program is more structured, but some of it is just as simple as linking people up with, with the local services. So uh, we have we are investing a lot of a, a lot of money in that, disinvesting it from institutional care. Uh, and we, you know, obviously as you'd expect it, we we run cycle paths so we can have more. So we you know, we try and make the physical environment also conducive to health. So, so in it, you know, I'm involved from a leadership point of view in, uh, you know, making the whole system uh, see the benefits of working together. You know, we will get further, faster working together than we will separately, uh, and I think everyone involved is now persuaded of that. And the particular piece that I will be able to, I hope, not allow us to lose sight of is this social piece. Because what uh, my fear has always been in Quebec, it may not happen, but a fear of mine is that if you let the social side become part of the health side, it all starts looking like a medical service, you know. And I'm not saying that will happen, but this has always been my fear of vertical integration. So I think by by bringing you know a larger part of the social sphere into this uh, integration, uh, keeping the public health, the social services, you know, housing, and this the more broader range of public services education, that uh, we can try and keep uh, a health focus as, as well as a, as a medical focus. So what do I think so far? Um, I think that's. I thought, well, you know, this is really useful for me to come and speak at this because, uh, you know, you don't think about things, do you, unless you're recalled upon to think. <laughs> Mostly you're just, you know, making sure everybody's getting on, making sure we're making progress, measuring our targets, you know, going up to the ministry, making uh, them think you're wonderful uh, so that they'll let you do the next exciting thing, uh, which is what we're trying to do. Uh, the accountable care system uh, is what we want to do. But so thinking a little bit, okay, you know, what do I think so far about all this? Well, this is definitely a job of managing change, you know, at a scale and with enormous complexity. And I didn't list all the institutions they were shown on the map, but you know, there are 14 big institutions on my patch, 3,000 volunteer organizations, you know, I mean, I've got 8,000 staff, we're spending a million pounds a day in the independent sector, that's not my organization, that's buying it, you know. So it's hugely complex, so you've, you're managing something at scale and with complexity. And you need to think about it as a managing change, you know, it's not writing a document and sending a memo, you know, it's a, uh, it's about managing people and getting the, uh, the whole population as well. So I think the five-year forward view, I think we're very fortunate to have a, a very good leader in charge of the NHSE. He's not a politician, but he's very adept politically. I think in that document and in his communications, he's expressed a vision with clear outcomes that are health-oriented, uh, not, uh, you know, not just about money and not just about targets, but health, which is what motivates the people working in the system. But he's also made a deal with government about what the resource framework was going to be. And that is what will get the most political noise when you're over, you'll hear, I'm sure from here even, the political noise out of the NHS. Because the deal was uh, 22 billion pounds of savings for 8 billion pounds of new money. And that's, that was a big deal. But that was the deal that, you know, he could make with the minister and uh, that's the one the prime minister is going to hold him to account on and that's the one we're trying to, uh, trying to deliver. But it was, it was clear to have a five-year view and, and clear to have a sense of where we were going. Very visible leadership, clinically designed with and led with these new models of care. I mean, I haven't heard anyone in my locality say anything but good things about these models of care, and they cover every, uh, every area. People were given the opportunity to be vanguards, um, and 
you know, it's, it's a funny way of doing policy, and, but they do it now quite a lot in the UK, which is you're invited to do something different. And it's, a, it's considered a privilege. Like my gang back home are, are putting a bed together to become the next accountable care system, you know. Rather than having to do it and giving into, and it starts in April or something, we're giving an opportunity to be one of the next ones, you know. And, and it was the same with the vanguards. I mean, my area didn't get one, you know. And this is considered sadness. So, so be giving people the opportunity to come up, giving them funding and extra attention is uh, part of the model, I think, that works better. The SDPs are entirely voluntary. The leadership is collective and consensual, and it's really driven only by a, a common understanding of the imperative for change. Um, there's, in fact, it's absolutely working in opposition to the entire legislative framework, which was introduced by Lansley you know, in, in 2010, I mean, every one of the institutions around the table that I chair is an independent organization. Its sovereignty, and they use that language, you know, it rests in its board and its statute and, it, and its trust. So in a way, we are working against the tide. And it's not easy, you know. But it's necessary because if you've been watching uh, international news, my government in Britain is kind of busy. <laughs> and it isn't got, it's, not, it's got a kind of international crisis with Europe going on and it's not going to, the word is clear, no legislation, you know. Nothing is going to happen except Brexit in my country for a long time. So uh, the good news is they won't be bothering us with stuff we don't want to do. That's always, there's always a silver lining. But the bad news is they're not going to solve the issues that we would have liked, perhaps. I mean, in the mandate for the Conservative government was change in the health service, but, you know, no one thinks that's going to happen. So, so it's interesting to be doing it in this way. From a managing uh, change and a leadership point of view, uh, I think it's quite it's quite an opportunity to get hold of the local situation and try and mobilize us around some common purpose uh, and you know take charge of it ourselves. Anyway, that, those are my thoughts. I don't know if I'll feel that way in a year's time, but that's how I'm feeling at this moment. And I think if you're in this kind of area, you know, you always have to see the optimism and the, and the possibility for the future. So I hope that made some sense. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about it today. I'm happy to take questions if we have time. Thank, Thank you. you.